Thank you, Nathan. And uh, <clears throat> I want to add a word of welcome to all of you who are new. Um, if I didn't know better, I think the room was full of Jehovah's Witness missionaries. <laughs> but I, don't, I think that's the wrong group. Um, yeah, and thinking about what um, might be helpful for you today, I um, was looking at a favorite passage of mine. I go back to it a lot, and I, I think if I can give you this text, it's going to be vital for the impact of your ministry. In fact, if I were to title this today, uh, I might title it, The Guaranteed Key to Ministry Success. How's that? The Guarantee for ministry success. What is that? Well, a lot of people are holding seminars ostensibly to teach people what they think the key to ministry success is. But um, I don't think anybody will come at it this way, but it's the right way. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. And just looking at verses 7 through 10, let me read them. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Not enough people are weak enough to be strong. But certainly Paul was. So I want to talk about this statement in verse 9, my grace, grace is sufficient for you. Chorus is a Familiar term, the term for grace used about 150 times in the New Testament. It means a benefit given or a favor bestowed. And in the case of the New Testament, a divine favor, a divine blessing from God with the power to transform a life and to accomplish spiritual goals and ends. His grace is sufficient. And in particular, in this text, his grace is sufficient to hold us together in our trials and even make us more powerful by them. When we read in Ephesians 2 that the Lord has dispensed to us the surpassing riches of his grace, I think we often assume that the list ends with sort of the blessing side of things. But here is something that cannot be overlooked one of the most significant and important graces and pertinent and critical to your ministry success is how you handle suffering and disappointment and rejection. And it was tough for Paul in his day, but it is exponentially more difficult for us in our day because of the internet. Looking back over the last 10, 12 years of my life, I I have seen thousands of times more hostility toward me than I knew in all the years leading up to that. Uh, the, The criticism just mount and mount and mount. And if there's ever anything we're gonna have to understand, it's how to respond to those 
false attacks. How to respond to the suffering that comes as a result of them. And I think Paul gives us really an amazing pattern to follow. So let's go back in 2 Corinthians, back all the way to chapter 1. And uh, Paul continually through this letter addresses the issue of his suffering, his difficulties, his trials. Chapter 1, verse 8, we do not want you to become unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had a sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. I mean, it was so severe. He knew he could be murdered at any time. He lived not in the hope of survival, but in the hope of resurrection. That's how pertinent the reality of impending suffering and death was. And he says that in verse 10. God, who raises the dead, delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. In verse 12, he adds to another kind of uh, suffering to add to the ones in 8 to 10, which has to do with physical persecution. He says this, our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. He was mercilessly being criticized, and he'll say more about that, to the degree that it would have been impossible for him to quell all the hostility, to answer all the enemies. So he rested in chapter 1, verse 12, on his conscience. All kinds of people are accusing me, but my proud confidence is this, by the grace of God, My conscience is not condemning me. Because in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we've conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. Criticism can destroy a person. Criticism can destroy you if your conscience is not clear. That's where the spiritual battle is really won. So Paul was being attacked physically, and he was being attacked in terms of even his spiritual life. In chapter 4, he says this, verse 7, we have this treasure, this treasure meaning, meaning the gospel, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We carry around the gospel treasure so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Again, he mentions that the power comes from God. The grace comes from God. And then he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death. Again, he brings up the reality that he could die as a martyr. And we do this for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. I mean, that's, that's the correspondent reality. To bring life to you, I have to face death every day. In chapter 6 and verse 4, he says, In everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, and here are the marks of faithful 
service, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, and the battle for purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. By verse 7, he's turning to the positive. In the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not being put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. That is a serious definition of the life of a minister, isn't it? But he could still say in verse 11, our mouth has spoken truly to you, O Corinthians, and our heart is opened wide. In chapter 6, that long litany of things that include the sufferings that he went through. But in chapter 7, just a brief comment in verse 6. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. I mean, he was not impervious to depression. What he suffered was obviously extremely discouraging. And he was comforted in the arrival of Titus with good news from Corinth. In chapter 10, In verse 10, he adds another attack by his critics. They say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. So he was persecuted. He was assaulted as to his spiritual integrity and his person his looks, his demeanor, even his speaking, even his speech, unimpressive and contemptible. Nothing about him escaped hostility. Nothing about him escaped hostility. He, uh, he in a very different way, experienced, um, if you want an illustration of it, what Donald Trump experiences. Just relentless, relentless assault and assault and assault from every possible anger, angle. Far more serious, uh, obviously, than the political issues. And then in chapter 11, in verse 23, he says, here, basically are my credentials. I speak as if I'm insane, verse 23. This, this sounds crazy. But um, am I a servant of Christ? Yes. How do I know that? Because I had 34 converts uh, in some synagogue? No. Uh, because I've been used to write epistles? No. Because the Lord has done miracles through my hands? No. The, the validity of my service to Christ, is proven by I have been in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. That was a Gentile form of punishment. Once I was stoned and actually died and came back. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. Story in Acts 27. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, 
dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. And by the way, that's not administrative concern. He explains what kind of concern it is in verse 29. Who is weak without my being weak? In other words, such a faithful pastor so totally identified with his people that he felt their spiritual weakness for them, with them. When they're weak, I'm weak. Who is led into sin without my intense concern? This is really the heart of the pastor, isn't it? All the external stuff and then that internal realization that the people that you have been called to shepherd are being embattled by Satan and in their weakness falling to sin and temptation and that should strike your heart as well. I take you through all of that just so that you understand this is the best of all men. This is the best. This is the best the kingdom had to offer then outside of Christ. And the reason he had so much trouble is because he was so faithful, because he preached the message that confronted sin. And this is what he had to live with. Pain of all kinds. But the deepest pain, and I think that's what he's saying in verse 28, beyond all the external things, there is this internal pressure that falls on me for all the churches, every church I've ever touched, been a part of. I feel the failures there. I feel the weakness there. I, I suffer intense concern over their sin. I wonder how many pastors would never even understand what that meant. They're, they're far from that. All of this is Paul's essentially giving us his credentials. So you you could look at Paul and say, um, show me your credentials. And he wouldn't show you a degree. He wouldn't show you an accomplishment. He would show you scars. His whole life was loving, unselfish, Highly dangerous sacrifice. And his concern reached down to the very depths of his soul. When he was first in Corinth, God, the Lord, felt like he needed some encouragement. Look at uh, Acts 18, 9. And the Lord said to Paul, in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer. So we learned from 2 Corinthians that he was depressed. Here we learn that he was afraid. So this is a normal guy. Don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent. I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you For I have many people in this city. Those are the elect. And you will be used by God to the gathering of the elect. No one is going to thwart God's purpose. So Paul clearly embraced the reality of suffering in ministry. At at a massive level, this was very much his badge of courage. He said, I bear in my body the marks of Christ. They can't get him, so they hit me. I'm standing in his places. He stood in my places. The sense in which uh, Christ took our place on the cross is reversed, and we take Christ's place in the church. And we will be assaulted. And again, I say, in, in our world, if you can't survive that and rise above that and call on the grace of God from a clear conscience, 
you're not going to make it because it's relentless. It's absolutely relentless. So how does Paul deal with this? That gets us to chapter 12. I'll tell you how he dealt with it. He prayed. And now we're talking about something very specific. Chapter 12 begins, as you remember, with uh, Paul saying he doesn't like to boast. He doesn't like to commend himself. But I, I will mention visions and revelations of the Lord. He had six visions just in the book of Acts and epistles. He said, I know a man, he, he's almost deferring by speaking um, of this as if it's not him, but another man. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know. God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Um, that, that's a very important way to express any kind of vision uh, with, with a lack of certainty about what really happened. I, I don't know. I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. I don't know. I don't know. God knows. Verse 3 repeats it again. I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. God knows. But I was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. So Paul did go to heaven and come back, but he didn't write a book and didn't talk about it. Why? Because on behalf of such a man in verse 5, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. I mean, he had so embraced his weaknesses that they were his own badge of faithfulness. But that didn't mean he necessarily liked the trials. And that leads us to verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that he had received, some of them visions and, of course, revelations from God out of which were penned the epistles, God had deposited massive volume of truth on him. And God, starting with Christ in the Damascus Road, had met him personally in remarkable ways that had never happened to anybody else. And because of all these things, there was a need to um, humble him. Too many revelations. So for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to keep me from Exalting myself. This is where you have to begin when you want to understand suffering. And the first point is God uses suffering to humble us. God uses suffering to humble us. Extraordinary, surpassing greatness in regard to the revelations he had received would tend to make any man proud. For this very specific reason, the Lord did this, did this painful thing to me, brought this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan, for the single purpose of humbling me. That's the number one Christian virtue. God exalts the humble, right? And humbles the proud. There was given me by God, obviously, a thorn in the flesh. Literally a thorn for the flesh. And the term there is not like the a rose thorn. It's like, a, it's like a spear. The Lord literally drove a, a, a spear through me. This is severe inflicting of pain, a spear in my otherwise proud flesh. And that particular spear can be identified as a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, there have been a lot of people who have offered an interpretation to what this means. 
I think it's pretty simple. What, what is a messenger of Satan? Well, the word messenger is angelos. What is a satanic angel? A demon. Does this mean that the Apostle Paul had a demon? No. It means that the demons had come to the church at Corinth. The demons had come to the church at Corinth. Angelos is 188 times in the New Testament. It always means a person. Some person, I think more than one person, some persons basically under the power of Satan were coming to the Corinthian church and shredding his reputation. And that takes you back to 1010. They say, they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. This was one of the attacks. What the false teachers wanted to do, and you, you can see it through the way that this epistle is crafted. They wanted to basically destroy Paul's credibility. And so they attacked him. They said that he, he falsified his effectiveness of his ministry. They, they said he was not authorized from the Jerusalem church to do what he did. They said he had an internal hidden life of secret shame. Talks about that early in the epistle. And that's why he defended himself in 112 at the level of his conscience, because they were striking blows at his very heart. But when Paul looks at this from the standpoint of chapter 12, he sees the invasion of these false leaders as demonic. And they have come into the church to do destruction. Chapter 11, verse 13. Such men, talking about them here, are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to to their deeds. So under the guise of religion, under the guise of representing God, demon-possessed teachers had come into the church. This tortured Paul. Again, the reason is, we just read it in chapter 11, because there was no weakness in a church without his feeling the pain. There was no concern without him feeling the sadness Demons were attacking his church. You say, well, why would the Lord allow that? Would the Lord ever allow that? Yeah, for one very important reason, to humble you and me. You mean the Lord would let demon-possessed false teachers have some entree into a church? Have to be a pretty good reason to do that. What would be the best reason that would allow God to do that? Why in his providence would he ever allow that to happen? Why wouldn't he stop the demons at the door because the humbling of the pastor is the priority for the church. And if you can't recognize that in your ministry, you're going to have some very hard days. But if you embrace that humbling, the grace of God will sustain you and make you strong. He says to torment me. The word there, the verb there is used in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 to refer to the blows that were pounded into the face of Jesus at the crucifixion. So you may wonder why all this trouble in my church, why it seems as though demons are turned loose in the church? What, what's going on in my church? How did this happen? Well, the answer is to humble you. The, the sooner you realize that, the sooner the Lord can say the work is done and get back to normal. Trials have many purposes. They test the strength of our faith. 
They wean us from worldly things. They call us to eternal hope. They reveal what we totally and truly love. They enable us to help others who suffer. They produce endurance. They equip us for greater usefulness. And they allow us to be like Christ when we share in his sufferings. But especially they humble us. Especially. You know, in Luke, um, Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you, right? And I, I, it's not recorded as such, but I'm sure in Peter's mind, this thought passed his mind. Well, you told him no, right? Surely you told him no. Understanding how important I am. No, actually, Peter, I told him yes. I told him yes, because you needed to be reduced to the point where you had no strength of your own at all. And when you're converted, you'll strengthen many. And that's exactly what happened. The transformation was massive from a quibbling, frightened, terrified, hiding, weak, cowardice man in the garden to the day of Pentecost, big transformation. Job says in chapter 42, I had heard of you at the hearing of my ears, but now my eye sees you and I repent in dust and ashes. I thought I knew you, but I've never known you like I know you through my suffering. That's James 4 again. God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. So the first thing you, you want to recognize is that you need to embrace those humbling times. God uses suffering also to draw us to himself. I I can tell you, while you're surrounded by crowds of people, at times the ministry can be very lonely. And I'm not talking in some melancholy way. I'm just saying the burden becomes overwhelming. The disappointments are just destructive. And you feel the pain of it all, and Paul did. And that's what leads to That second point, God uses suffering to draw us to himself. And that's exactly what happened in verse 8. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. You could say that suffering increases the, the intensity of your communion with God. Is that a good thing? Blessing won't do it. Suffering will do it. When you have nowhere to turn and you're out of your own strength and you you have no power to silence your enemies, you can't stop the things that are happening that feel destructive. You end up with the throne of grace. You end up on your knees before the Lord by yourself. (coughs) And that was Paul. And so on three separate occasions, he asked the Lord to remove this. Now, that's, that's... That's really a gospel way to pray, isn't it? In Luke uh, chapter 11, the Lord tells a story about persistence in prayer. You're much asking. Just a footnote, Paul doesn't talk to Satan. He doesn't dismiss Satan. I remember being at a Southern Baptist pastor's conference. Huge, I think it was 25,000 pastors in somewhere at Georgia Dome or New, New Orleans or whatever. And the man got up to pray. And he, first thing he said, let's pray. And out of his mouth came, Satan, what did I just hear? <laughs> Satan. And then he proceeded to tell Satan what he wanted him to do. I, I could barely con- collect my thoughts. I'll never forget that. Let's pray. Satan? No. He prayed to the Lord. And he implored the Lord. I mean, it's intense. And he did it on three separate occasions. I can think back to when my son Mark, well, it was discovered that he had a brain tumor. And the... um, 
the neurological surgeon said to me it could be um, terminal. It turned out not to be, but at that point in time, this is my 19 or 20 year old son. And I can tell you immediately that changes your prayer life. Immediately. All of a sudden, you don't, you don't have to put prayer time on your calendar. And you can take food off your calendar. I don't remember how, exactly how many days I fasted and prayed, but it was a good part of a week. And the sweet communion and the presence of God at that time took me from prayers that started out, Lord, save him, Lord, save him, Lord, save him, to finally, Lord, do your will. Do your will. And that's where Paul is. So ministry suffering humbles us. And that is essential. It draws us to the Lord. That is essential. How many times do you read in the Psalms where the psalmist goes to God to deal with his enemies? Psalm 27, I was reading it yesterday. And he trusts in God to deal with his enemies because he can't do it. But thirdly, in this text, God uses suffering to display his grace. No, the Lord said, I'm not going to remove this demonic invasion for the time being, but my grace is sufficient for you. Not removing the pain, I'll increase the grace. That, that's when grace is the sweetest. When you literally are in the worst of times and you feel like you've been picked up and taken into heaven, you've been elevated, you've been exalted above it all, you, you, begin, to, you begin to draw on something that has uh, never been experienced before because I don't think you get the grace you need for those dire moments until those moments come. You, you, you say, well, I don't know how I would act if my child died. No, you don't, of course, because in thinking about that, you can only react the way you are now reacting. You don't have the grace that comes in the moment. But, but the Lord says to him, my grace is sufficient. You need the trial to be humbled. You need the trial to depend on me. And so I'll ramp up the grace. That's what you really need. And then you will be able to endure. There's a fourth use of suffering in the life of a minister in verse 9. Pick it up. Middle of the verse. Most gladly, therefore... Now he's, he's gone from what? Brokenheartedness, crying out to the Lord, praying three times about something that he feels is shredding his flesh. And the circumstances haven't changed, but he's different. Most gladly, all of a sudden, there's no therapy here. This isn't some kind of psychological adjustment. Most gladly, not just gladly, but most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses. Now we're, we're touching the Paul that we read about in all those other passages, right? By the time he wrote this letter, he'd experienced all this. And he could write that all down with gladness. Because it exposes my weakness and that means that the power of Christ dwells in me. So if you look at Paul and you try to analyze him and say, well, he had tremendous human gifts. Well, I don't know about that. His um, speech was contemptible. His presence was unimpressive. He seemed to have only a few sermons. He always spoke about Christ and him crucified. 
There was really nothing about him except the power of Christ was in him because his own personal self-confidence had been broken. When we have nothing to deal with the battle in our own strength and our own arsenal, his grace will go to work. You know, when Paul wrote Romans 8, I won't go to it. He listed out all those things that cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ. Those are all out of his personal biography. He went through all of them. And he found that none of them, none of them separated him from the love of Christ. How did he know that? Because there was grace upon grace upon grace upon grace poured into his life through all of the vicissitudes. And he, he could literally define his life as to its usefulness as a product of his weakness. Back in 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the weak things of the world to shame those which are strong. And then the Lord gets all the glory. So here's his summation. Therefore, verse 10, I am well content with weaknesses. That's quite a, that's quite a journey in four verses. From pounding the doors of heaven to get relief to saying, most gladly, I accept suffering. I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. You're, you're going to know success in the ministry when you can say verse 10 is my testimony. That's my testimony. I am content to be misunderstood. I am content to be misrepresented. I am content to be assaulted. I am content to be unable to defend myself against my enemies. I am content with the distresses that come, with the persecutions, with the difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. It was his weakness that made him strong. I don't know that any of us is so bold as to pray, Lord, make me weak, but that's a good prayer. So when you have the deepest trouble, the trouble of a broken heart over a church that you've invested so much of your life into that is being attacked by false teachers, demon-inspired false teachers, when your heart is broken over the fact that you're afraid to even go visit them as he also says in this epistle because he's afraid that what he's going to find out is going to, is going to invalidate his entire ministry. Go, go over to chapter 12 again. Look down at verse 20. I'm afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to be not what you wish. Perhaps I'm going to find strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, Arrogance, disturbances. And I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, sensuality which they have practiced. I mean, it was the sanctification of the church that was on his heart. So, the deepest trouble, the deepest pain of unfulfilled relationships and get used to it because the people who will inflict the most pain on you are the ones that get the closest to you for the longest time. They don't all do that, but that's where the, the worst of them come from. But God uses all those things to humble us, draw us to himself, display his grace, and perfect his power. So, what's the key to ministry success? Understanding the refining work that God is doing in your life through the difficulties. If you can embrace those, the, the paradox of 
suffering, you, you will experience the fullness of ministry at a level that will bring glory to God and satisfaction to your own soul. At the end, what did Paul say? I finished the course. I kept the faith. And he looked forward to his eternal reward. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful testimony of the Apostle Paul. So helpful for us. He's alive in our own minds. The scripture brings him to life and lets us have a model that we can look to and follow. I pray for these men that there will be an open-heartedness to those things that you send our way that do the greatest work in our hearts. The things that bring us to the end of our self-confidence, the end of our strategies, the end of our wisdom, and we can do nothing but be humbled, cry out to you, call on grace. And having done that, heaven unleashes power to fulfill what the Lord would do through us. Bless these men, Lord, and may this uh, be a memorable morning as we shared this particular truth. May it come back to serve them well through the years to come. In Christ's name, amen.